Support for this program comes from my Patreon community. If you'd like to become a Relax Your Grids superfan, pledge for $2 a month, and in exchange, you'll get a Relax Your Grids sticker, as well as exclusive bonus content. This show's exclusive features Greg talking passionately about his barbecue recipe. Full disclosure, I still haven't had it, but my hope is that next time he and I visit, that barbecue will be on the menu. Welcome to Relax Your Grid. I'm your host, Matt Brown. In this episode, I interview Dr. Gregory Reich about the album we made together and his work at the Center for Popular Music and Spring-Fed Records. Included in the latter is some breaking news regarding Ed Haley and Bill Monroe in the same sentence. I want to take a moment to apologize to fiddler Casey Meikle. I forgot to mention him when Greg and I discussed the Ed Haley tribute show that we were all involved in at the Station Inn. Also on the bill that night was Matt Combs. Matt was unfortunately sick and so didn't make it, even though his name is on the poster. Greg Reich, welcome to Relax Your Grid. Happy to be here, Matt. Thanks for the invitation. It's so good to see you again. We're doing this on Zoom. You're coming to us live from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Is that right? Beautiful Murfreesboro, Tennessee. That's right. About 30 miles southeast of Nashville, in between Nashville and Chattanooga, but closer to the former. It's such a beautiful area, and, and we're going to talk later on, well, soon, about the office from which you're speaking, as well as the record label that you oversee. But I thought, let's let's actually start with how you and I met, because it's kind of an interesting story. So I remember, I'm recording in Colorado right now, I met a mutual friend of ours before I met you, Rachel Bayman, while I was teaching at the Rocky Mountain Fiddle Camp, and... I was on the verge of moving to Chicago, and she had grown up in Chicago, in Oak Park, Illinois, actually. And she and I had a blast playing some music together over the course of the week. And she made a point of saying, when you get to Chicago, you got to look up Greg Reich. And I think she might have even given me your email or your phone number. And so as a dutiful friend, I I followed her advice and I reached out to you. And thus blossomed a, an incredible friendship that's led to us making a record together and, and traveling to different states to play music together and eating lots of delicious food. So shout out to Rachel for connecting us. Absolutely. Yeah, I knew. Well, I lived in Oak Park, which is how I got to know Rachel. And we had a a weekly uh, bluegrassy, folky jam session at the farmer's market. And uh, when I first moved to Oak Park, uh, Rachel was in high school at that point, but already a really fine musician. And uh, we had a lot of fun playing together and we played a few gigs together uh, in town. And uh, then she moved away to come to uh, Vanderbilt uh, here in in Tennessee. Uh, But I do remember when she told me uh, that Matt Brown was moving to Chicago. And I said, Matt Brown? Like, that Mount Matt Brown, like, um, I said, what in the world is he doing moving to Chicago? Um, and, uh, yeah, she, she, uh, she hooked us up and, uh, we hit it off that the first time we actually met face to face was a night, um, I was performing for a coffee house that my wife and I used to run at a little church near our house in Oak Park. We called it the Kitchen Girl Coffee House, and you ended up playing there a couple of other times with uh, with other people. Uh, but you came that first night uh, to hear me play, and then uh, we actually performed one or two songs together, as I recall. Oh, right! I totally forgot about that. That was such a great event that you that you and Abby ran. Um, I I think my favorite because I I attended several of them after the one where I met you, just as a as an audience member because it was such a great series. And I remember y'all had um, Greg Cahill, front man of Special Consensus, with Don Sternberg, who at one time had played with Special C many years prior. But Don is known as like the the world's greatest living um, exponent of like the of the Jethro Burns style mandolin. And right. Their duo show was such a blast. And by then I knew I knew both of them pretty well. And it was just it was a magical evening and so fun such good music. I'll, I'll never forget that. We had a lot of uh, good nights, but that was definitely a standout. Of course, those guys, 
they're such superb musicians and they've known each other for decades and decades. And so they were having so much fun yeah. cutting up and, you know, pulling out tunes that neither one of them had really thought about for a very long time. Uh, we had another night with Greg Cahill reuniting with Josh Williams. That was amazing. Uh, too. The, you know, the fabulous bluegrass guitar player. Um, and they hadn't played together at all for years. Uh, right. And that was a really fun night uh, as well with Greg. Uh, but we had you know, so many other wonderful guests come through the Kitchen Girl Coffee House. Uh, that was a that was a labor of love, but it was it was fun. It was a great event. So, so cool. And it took a couple of years. I mean, you and I, as you said, started playing music together immediately upon meeting each other. Um, but one one thing that's interesting to me about our friendship is that when I met you, I, I didn't think I would ever make another old time fiddle album. I had I had made a couple Lone Prairie with um, Paul Brown and Bev Beverly Smith and then two other subsequent records that were solo albums. And I knew those records. That's that's why when Rachel told me you were moving to town, I was like, wow, Matt Brown's moving to town. Like I, I knew your work and had admired it already. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I was still playing a ton of old time music, um, but I just wasn't sure that I'd ever make another record. I just wasn't sure why I would do it. I felt like, well, you just play more old time tunes, but you can do that without having to pay to go into a studio or, or put out um, an actually actual album. But then I started playing with you. I was very impressed by your guitar playing um, from the start. And I remember there was a night when you and I played a square dance in Nashville, Tennessee. Do you remember this? I do remember. Yeah. Um, and afterwards, I, I was just so taken with your guitar approach and how good I felt as a fiddler when you play guitar that I suggested that we make an album. And fortunately, you said yes. Yeah. So we lived in the same city for quite a few years, but we waited until I moved to Tennessee and then we decided to make an album. Yeah, it made, made perfect sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And and I think soon thereafter, I, I probably did this after you and I decided to make this album, but we decided, what if we made a fiddle and guitar record, which is sounds like a pretty simple idea, but isn't actually that common in, anymore in the old time music world. No, it's not common at all. Uh, but of course, I mean, as you know, if you listen back to those records from the 20s, there's tons of fiddle and guitar duets on the 20s, maybe less in the 30s with the fiddle, but uh, but lots and lots of great uh, guitar and fiddle duets. People tend to think of, you know, the core of the old time string band as banjo and fiddle. Uh, and there's good reason to, to, uh, to think that. But at the same time, the guitar and fiddle duet is one that goes way back, has its own rich history, its own repertory, and its own kind of stylistic scope. Um, and you and I, you know, loved a lot of those records, a lot of those artists, the Stripling Brothers and, you know, Clark and Luch Luchas Kessinger and I mean, on and on. There's so many great examples. Um, some of the Doc Roberts stuff, you know, that has, um, it might have three instruments, but, you know, guitar is a prominent um, accompanying instrument. Uh, so, yeah, even though you and I both play uh, numerous instruments, it was a great idea, I think, in retrospect, to to concentrate on what for each of us is our primary medium. You make a good point. You know, like the banjo is crucial to old time music. If if it weren't for that instrument and its predecessors and the journey of that instrument with enslaved Africans over into the New World, old time music wouldn't be what it is. But as a fiddle player, if I think purely about arrangements, for example, there is so much freedom and there was so much freedom when, when we put together Speed of the Plow, knowing that I was going to be on the fiddle, that there wasn't going to be another melody instrument per se, not a mandolin, not a banjo, and that you were going to cover the entirety of the chordal and rhythmic, like um, just the constant rhythm section. Like you were you were the whole rhythm section. I was the whole melodic section. And we, you know, on, on the tune Speed of the Plow, we brought you in to play to play the the tune itself for a minute and that was a you know that was a lovely way to to kick things off
it freed me up a lot with my variations and and with you know rhythmic push and pull against your against against the backdrop that you created that's where i started to get excited is that the chance to to express these fiddle tunes in a way that felt very open and um i felt very inspired by the concept and then by the actual practice of it and we got lucky i i asked my friend um dave dave cinco who is one of the best recording engineers in american music if he would mind <laughs> terribly um engineering this for us and he immediately started asking questions about what i had in mind and and sure enough he he signed up to do it and that experience of being in at, at the groove palace with him in nashville um in the same room there he is against you know on that wall with his computer and and his whole rig there and you and i just a couple feet away we we turned out most of that record in a day i think 15 of the cuts in a day yeah and yeah. just had such a good time together and with him and the blazing saddles jokes and the, <laughs> a couple really delicious meals so um yeah that's a such a great memory yeah dave was a pleasure to work with i mean the guy's a genius but he's so understated um just in his demeanor and the way he works um if you don't know about him and what he's accomplished and so on you, you you wouldn't be immediately struck by the the power and presence um uh, that he brings um at, you know to a session uh or to a live gig for that matter he does of course a lot of his work is uh, live sound reinforcement he didn't do that for us but um but dave was just i mean he's just kind of a magician in a way that um that I think a lot of engineers aspire to. They, you know, he he has a way of letting the music and the instruments and the musicians just kind of be themselves and capturing the sound of the room. And I remember he talked a lot about wanting the recordings to sound like they sounded to him sitting right there in a small room with us. Uh, and he pulled that off in, you know, the big way. He's very much a a hands-off kind of engineer, a less is more kind of uh, engineer. But he captured what we were doing and uh, also made a lot of uh, artistic suggestions that were really, really uh, right on point. I think the one in particular, it was kind of the moment when, when you and I both looked at each other and said, he's got to get co-producer credit on this for that suggestion alone if nothing else it it was on uh, yellow dog blues and we were trying to figure out how to get just the right kind of feel and uh what was it that dave said i think i think he said to you that you need to let the guitar lead on this one not play the melody but but sort of establish the feel which blew my mind and you and I don't usually have trouble locking into a groove, which is why and this is this is just one facet of Dave's brilliance. And you'll be delighted to know that Dave is going to be a future guest on this podcast. Oh, as absolutely as he should be. I've already uh, got a verbal agreement. Um, so folks will hear a lot more from Dave soon. Um, but yeah, you and I usually are very locked in on on like the square dance tunes and the waltzes and it, all that just like we don't have to say much to each other which is why this works so well but for some reason on that tune i just wasn't quite gelling and i wasn't finding my spot and dave just turned around and in his you know just very natural unassuming way suggested that i respond to you and let you yeah let you establish this groove and the moment he said that we got the take that we needed right yeah, it was it was just a, a very wise and like immeasurably helpful suggestion, you know, one sentence long, and it just like all of our our uh, uh, challenges and, and obstacles with trying to get the right feel for this tune were just went out the window immediately as soon as he said that. So uh, yeah, he he uh, deserves a whole lot of credit for. Uh, with the sound of that record and the music on it. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> You're
You're coming to us from the Center for Popular Music at Middle Tennessee State University. What is your role there? Well, I'm the director. Uh, I'm a musicologist by training and a career academic in addition to my pursuits as a performing musician. And um, I came here in 2014 to become the director. I do a little bit of teaching here at Middle Tennessee State, but most of my job involves the uh, administrative oversight of the Center for Popular Music. The center is a research center and an archive of rare, in some cases unique materials uh, related to the study of American popular music as broadly defined as you can imagine that phrase to be. Uh, so we have things related to every genre and every documented period of popular music, uh, both commercial genres and non-commercial folk genres. Uh, we have uh, sound recordings, of course, and sheet music and song books going back to the 18th century. We have manuscript collections from uh, musicians and, and uh, scholars and music industry people and um, photographs and all kinds of materials, over a million items in total. The center was founded in 1985, uh, and uh, so it's had a long time to, to build up uh, a very fine collection, and the collection continues to grow. It's one of the things uh, that I do as director is uh, prioritize, seek out uh, new uh, materials, most of which come to us now by donation. We do buy things occasionally, um, but most of what we acquire now is through donations. And so I spend a lot of time cultivating relationships with donors, potential donors, uh, both here in Nashville in the Middle Tennessee area and beyond. I mean, being located so close to Music City, USA, has certainly shaped the uh, collection here at the center, uh, although we do embrace all of music across the United States and even sometimes into other countries as much as we can justify it. Um, but our, our, our location here in Nashville is, uh, or close to Nashville, is certainly uh, a huge advantage for us. Uh, and we've been able to pull in some uh, pretty remarkable uh, collections uh, from from folks here. I mean, just to give one quick example, a collection that we got not long after I arrived here in 2014 uh, that came from uh, Lance Leroy, who um, he's passed away now, but his son, uh, Lanny, donated uh, a bunch of his materials. Lance, uh, to people in the music industry, particularly in bluegrass and, and folk genres, will know his name immediately. He was a longtime agent, manager, booking person, primarily working with um, bluegrass and some folk artists. Uh, Lester Flatt in the Nashville Grass, for example, one of his most prominent uh, clients. Uh, he was a, a founding board member of the IBMA and, you know, just a guy who was around the scene, not a household name, not even to fans of Bluegrass. They might not know the name, but a guy who collected, I mean, his business papers and some of the one-off unique recordings that he had on reel-to-reel -reel tape of, you know, Lester Flat jamming with a 15-year-old Marty Stewart and stuff like that, you know. So I remember uh, when I drove up to Hendersonville, to pick up that collection from Lanny at his house. And I drove back, uh, and on the way back, I stopped for lunch, at, I think at the Waffle House, which is one of your favorite places. And uh, I remember thinking, you know, I'm sitting here at the Waffle House uh, and I've got Lester Flatt's tax returns in, my, in the trunk of my car. And I said, <laughs> this, this is a pretty cool gig that I've got. You know, so, um, yeah, we have Lester Flatt's tax returns here, which, you know, could be interesting if somebody were writing a a, uh, a bio of Lester Flatt, which is a, a book that needs to be written, by the way, uh, or if somebody were doing a study of, um, you know, business practices and income for bluegrass artists or country artists, I mean, stuff like that uh, can be valuable to uh, to serious researchers. So that's the kind of material that we have here at the center. And we support the teaching and the the you know the, the 
students and faculty here at MTSU, but we're also open to the broader community of scholars and researchers. We have visiting musicians. We have people coming from all over the country and occasionally from abroad who are working on you know, PhD dissertations on popular music topics. We have documentarians here. Uh, the, um, the recent Ken Burns country music uh, docu-series uh, used some of the photographs from our archive, uh, for example. In addition to all of the uh, research uh, and teaching support that we do through the archival collection, the center also does a lot of uh, programming and outreach. So we have public programs of various kinds where we bring in book authors to do talks about recent books. Uh, we have uh, musicians or music industry people to come in and talk about their careers. Uh, we've done film screenings with, you know, a Q&A with a director to follow, that sort of thing. Uh, and, um, and we also have our record label, uh, which is a big part of our um, public outreach effort, and that's uh, Springfed Records. I'm glad you mentioned Springfed because if folks just go to springfedrecords.com. As I hope they will, of course. I mean, it's what I do every morning when I get up. Um, you'll find records from Mississippi John Hurt, John Hartford, Sam and Kirk McGee, Uncle Dave Macon, um, John Work the Third, the Fairfield Four. Um, the the three the three artists or the three records though that I I wanted to hear about from you though are this group of albums that are that are connected based on the locale. So you have an album from Felipe Perez, um, another from Lorenzo Martinez and Rabbit Sanchez, and then a third from Belen Escobedo. And I wonder if you could just tell folks about those three albums and, and the musicians involved. Sure. In fact, um, there's a fourth album, the most recent one that I would add to that list, and that is uh, a record by the Jimenez brothers, Eddie and Ruben Jimenez. What links all four of these uh, titles in our catalog is that they are um, San Antonio musicians, Tejano musicians. So the the scope and the mission of Spring Fed uh, embrace uh, Southern grassroots folk music. And historically, that's been mostly music from within about a hundred mile radius of where we are in middle Tennessee right now. So we've ended up with uh, a lot of um, string band music, fiddle and banjo music, some, uh, some early country singing, a little bit of regional bluegrass. Uh, there's also, as you mentioned, there's some blues and some gospel music, both black and white gospel on the label. But I have been working since I arrived here to broaden the uh, the understanding of what Southern music is, both historically and currently. And so I have been working in various ways to try to build up the center's involvement with and collection of Hispanic music, Spanish language music uh, here uh, in the United States and even stretching uh, across the border into Mexico uh, a little bit. Um, and so I started to call in, um, you know, connections that I had to scholars and musicians that I know that that worked in, in Texas or in, in other kinds of Latino music. And uh, one of those connections was uh, Dan Margulies. And folks in the old time community might know Dan. He's a, a clifftop and Mount Airy regular, uh, the colonel, they call him. Uh, Dan is an academic like myself. His field is actually history. He teaches at a university uh, in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, but he kind of moonlights as an ethnomusicologist. And Dan has been uh, making trips down to South Texas, specifically San Antonio, for, oh gosh, it must be close to 20 years now. Uh, he has made all sorts of connections in the community of traditional musicians in San Antonio. He's gotten to know the music uh, and its history very, very well. Uh, so Dan hooked me up with uh, some of the folks in San Antonio, and, and the first results of that were working with uh, Lorenzo Martinez, the great accordion player who uh, just passed uh, last year. 
and uh, Rabbit Sanchez, who is, in my mind, the greatest living player of the 12-string bass guitar called the Bajo Sexto. And we invited Rabbit and Lorenzo to come up here to uh, Murfreesboro. I think that was in 2016, if memory serves. And they did a public program where they played a lot of their music and talked about it. Dan was here to, to do the kind of a public interview with them. And we loved them and their music so much that we said, let's make a record with you guys and put it out on Spring Fed. <laughs> I should mention here that when I say we, um, John Fabke is a very important partner in everything we do for Springfed. John is a, a musician and a folklorist and a man of, of many skills and talents. Uh, he does a lot of uh, work here at the CPM, grant work and, and uh, other kinds of things, but he's also the manager of Springfed Records. So he takes care of a lot of the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Uh, in addition to, um, you know, working with me as kind of the brain trust of uh, of Springfed. So, so John and I, you know, once we heard Rabbit and Lorenzo live here at MTSU, we decided we needed to make a record with them. A few of those live tracks, by the way, ended up on the CD that came out. Uh, a ten, I think it's ten tracks that were recorded in San Antonio, and then there's another four or five that uh, came from the recordings we made here live at MTSU. <laughs> Uh, and that was the first one. Uh, the album is called um, Old School Polkas del Ghost Town. Ghost Town being a um, historically uh, Mexican-American neighborhood on the west side of uh, San Antonio, where Lorenzo himself grew up. Uh, once a very rough place. Um, when we went down in 2017 for the uh, release shows in San Antonio, I got to meet some other musicians at that time. Um, and a couple of those ended up being our subsequent releases. Uh, Felipe Perez, who you mentioned, uh, is a fabulous old school accordion player. Uh, he's from Corpus Christi originally, now lives in San Antonio, but he's an exemplar of the Corpus Christi style, which is a, a faster and more ornamented style of playing than what you hear in other uh, regions. Um, just a great guy and an absolute master musician. John uh, Fabke and I have talked uh, a number of times about uh, the privilege and the honor it's been to be able to spend time with and, and play music with a guy like Felipe, which for us is is almost like a Tommy Gerald type of experience that a, you know the earlier generation of revivalists had, just a, a direct connection to the true vine of that particular musical tradition. And uh, Felipe has been so generous in um, working with us, his willingness to, to play with me and John. We brought Felipe up here uh, to Nashville for a series of gigs, including one at the Country Music Hall of Fame. Uh, John and I accompanied him, because uh, I have been studying the Bajo Sexto, learning from Rabbit Sanchez, uh, and also learning some from Felipe himself, who uh, used to play a lot of Bajo, uh, now it's strictly accordion. Um, but he, he, he certainly helped me, uh, to kind of dial in, you know, some of the finer points of the style, but Felipe has been so welcoming. I mean, he's, he's, um, he's a perfectionist and he is strict about the way something should be played in his mind 
and he's not hesitant to tell us uh, or anyone, uh, no, it shouldn't be done that way. You need to do this. But he's very kind and um, and gentle about those uh, those tips and and those um, those little pearls of wisdom. So it's very humbling to work alongside a musician like that. I mean, this is a guy who's now uh, he's eighty, I think. Um, started playing professionally when he was 13 in the cantinas in Corpus Christi. Uh, and so, he, I mean, he's done it all. He's seen it all. He's played with everybody uh, and just a, a master musician who is still at this late stage of his career and his life um, still doing incredible work. The other musician that, uh, that we met uh, is Belen Escobedo who is uh, really remarkable and, and stands out even among the San Antonio musicians in a number of ways that make her unique. First of all, she's a fiddle player. And there aren't many fiddle players left in San Antonio in the, in the Tejano community and, and in that tradition. Many generations ago, if you go back to the early 20th century or late 19th century even, there's a lot of evidence that the fiddle was the main instrument among the Tejanos in South Texas, and also on the other side of the border in the, what we now call Norteño music of Northern Texas, uh, Northern Mexico rather. Um, when the accordion arrived, uh, introduced primarily by Central and East European immigrants of various kinds, Czech and Polish and Jewish immigrants, German immigrants to those areas, the accordion uh, came to, to replace the fiddle for the most part for the dance music, for celebrations to be played in the bars and cantinas and in other uh, kind of festive uh, settings. Because the accordion is louder, it is uh, self-contained, you don't necessarily need other instruments because you know if you know how to play the, uh, the bass buttons and the, the chord buttons, you can, you can accompany yourself on the accordion, which is not done that much anymore. Felipe still plays that way. Uh, but not many of the younger players uh, know how to do that or, or want to do that. Um, so the accordion came to replace the fiddle. And, and a lot of the older generation uh, accordion players that I've gotten to know and been able to, uh, to interview and, and learn from, and I asked them about uh, some of the oldest tunes they know, uh, it's pretty common to hear them respond that, oh, I learned this from my grandfather or my great uncles who used to play the fiddle. That older generation um, going back, as I said, to the early 20th century, but all those tunes and, and all of those uh, performance settings now kind of transferred over to the accordion. But Lannis Gobedo is one of the last, uh, if not the last, fiddle player who is keeping that repertory and that older style alive. She's very dedicated to it, uh, tremendously talented. She has played mariachi music over the years as a violinist and has done a lot of different things. She was a, a, uh, an orchestra teacher in the San Antonio Public Schools for, for many years. She's a trained, a formally trained uh, musician, uh, but she plays these old folk tunes uh, and popular tunes that were around a hundred years ago and and more uh, in a way that just, I mean, you just don't hear it from anybody else anymore. It's also remarkable that uh, she's a woman because this is a musical culture that has been dominated by men. And she talks uh, uh, a lot about what she's experienced as a woman in the mariachi world and in the Tejano Conjunto world. Uh, but she has persisted, and um, she's just a very, very special person. I mean, a, a really, um, truly magnificent artist, a wonderful person with a personality as big as Texas itself, proud Tejana. You know, she grew up on the south side of San Antonio, the south and west sides of the historically uh, Mexican-American parts of town, and she's a very proud south sider. Uh, I also want to mention her husband, Ramon Gutierrez. Uh, Ramon is originally from Guadalajara, the city in, in the Mexican state of Jalisco. That's the city of mariachis. And uh, he is a real mariachi. He has a voice 
that could just melt the paint right off the wall. It's so rich and powerful. In fact, the very first time I heard Ramon sing was at the release show I mentioned earlier with uh, uh, Rabbit and Lorenzo, and they brought up Ramon as a as a special guest uh, to sing one or two numbers uh, with them. And somebody handed him a microphone, and he looked at it, and he just like, what? microphone. What do I need this for? I just kind of put it to the side, um, which I thought was a strange gesture until he opened his mouth. And then I was like, oh my gosh, like this guy could be an operatic tenor. He could have been an operatic tenor. Um, he's got that kind of, uh, of instrument. He's also a really, really talented bass player, especially um, the, the Mexican bass called the Tololoche. Uh, he plays the bajo sexto and a whole variety of other instruments. He's uh, grew up in mariachi, but has learned the conjunto and the Tejano styles. And I mean, he's just an incredibly prolific guy. He must know 5,000 songs and he can sing each one in, in English and Spanish as needed. Uh, just an incredible musician. Uh, and so he and Belen uh, obviously play together a lot, being husband and wife, and uh, they sing together. Uh, in addition to her wonderful fiddling, they do sing together. We have several tracks on the record of them uh, doing these just fantastic, heart-melting duets. Uh, it's just been such a pleasure and an honor to get to know them. last record, uh, the most recent one from San Antonio, is the one that we did with uh, Ruben and Eddie Jimenez, who are two brothers of Flaco and Santiago Jimenez. Uh, the name Flaco is probably the best known around um, the United States uh, because of all the crossover collaborative work that Flaco Jimenez uh, has done, Lifetime Grammy Achievement Award, and so on, all well-deserved. Uh, what uh, people outside the Tejano community might not know is that the Jimenez family is a, is a whole dynasty of uh, great musicians, San Antonio musicians. Uh, the father, Santiago Jimenez Sr., was one of the creators of the conjunto style uh, in San Antonio, a, a pioneering accordion player, kind of the, the Bill Monroe, a Bill Monroe-type patriarchal figure uh, in the conjunto world. And the sons are uh, Flaco, of course, and Santiago Jr., who's had quite a bit of notoriety himself, another person I've gotten to know and spend a lot of time with in San Antonio. Eddie and Ruben are two of the other brothers who were never uh, professional musicians. They're not well known uh, outside the family in the immediate circles. Uh, but they, the two of them spent a lot of time together, um, particularly since uh, Eddie's wife passed away several years ago. And they just like making music just for the fun of it and the nostalgia and what it means to them and the memories of their family and their father and so on. And um, Ruben accompanies him on a 12-string guitar, not a bajo sexto. When he was a kid, he wanted a bajo sexto, uh, but there wasn't one available for him, and they didn't have the money to buy one. But somehow, the family got their hands on a regular 12-string guitar, and Ruben developed a an utterly unique way to string the instrument and to tune it uh, so that, especially when it's plugged in, it sounds kind of like a bajo sexto, and the way he plays it uh, helps with that effect. So the album that we did with them, Musica Alegre, is um, almost all original compositions by Eddie. He's playing a two-row button accordion, a really old-fashioned kind of accordion that belonged to his father. It's the last one of Santiago Sr.'s instruments that uh, are st is still with the family. And, uh, and Ruben accompanying him in his uh, utterly original 
uh, way of playing the the twelve string guitar to simulate the sound of a bajo sexto. So it's just a wonderful record. Two delightful guys. Um, again, a privilege to know and get to know and spend time with so many of these folks. There are a number of other musicians that we haven't recorded yet for Spring Fed Records. I hope we'll continue uh, to uh, to mine the the great musical. Uh, talents of of San Antonio, but personally, one of the most important things for me, one of the most gratifying things for me, has been uh, the incredible um, feeling of welcoming that I've experienced uh, going to San Antonio. I mean, I've only been going there for now for about five years. I mean, but it, it feels like a lifetime. I've, I've gotten so much out of it. I've spent so much time there, had so many rich and memorable experiences. And none of that would have been possible had all of these musicians and their families not been so welcoming and so open. There is a history in that community of uh, white people taking advantage of them in various ways, both inside and outside of the music industry. They would have every legitimate reason and justification for being suspicious or you know, not wanting to share their culture and their cultural riches uh, with an outsider like myself. Um, I mean, I'd never even set foot in San Antonio until I went down for the very first... Uh, a Rabbit and Lorenzo uh, release show in early 2017. Uh, since then, I've been there more times than I can count. I mean, I, I've actually lost count probably 10 or 12 times uh, in the in, over the course of, of just a few years. Um, and when I first went to San Antonio, not knowing many people, not knowing what to expect, I was struck by how um, how much the members of this community prize their own unique cultural heritage uh, to a lot of white people um, who in Texas are generally just called Anglos, no matter where their families actually come from, they're just Anglos. But to a lot of Anglos, um, you know, folks like uh, Belen and, and Felipe and, and Rabbit, I mean, are, are Mexicans. But they're not Mexicans. They they are proud uh, uh, citizens of the United States and and members of the the distinctive community in South Texas. Uh, they know that their families do have a Mexican heritage, and of course they're very proud of that too. But there's there's a distinction between their own culture, their own music, their own food, and 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 all the other cultural ways. Uh, and those of the true Mexicans. They know there's a relationship. They are primos, they're cousins, but they are first and foremost proud Tejanos. And um, I mean, some of them, their families have been in that area since before Texas was part of the United States. So um, whereas a, a lot of white people might might look at at those communities and think, well, these you know were at one point immigrant communities. No, actually, they've been there, and th it's the border that moved. In fact, uh, not them. And uh, of course, they're proud also of their indigenous heritage. Most of these folks uh, are of mestizo heritage that is mixed. They have some Spanish Iberian. Um, blood. They have some indigenous blood, um, and they're very proud of of that indigenous part of their heritage as well. So, for someone like me, um, you know, a white guy, an academic coming from Tennessee, um, you know, they might have every reason to be suspicious of my intentions. Uh, but it didn't take long uh, for them to uh, to open up. And to warm up and to realize that what I was trying to do um, was uh, learn about their culture and in a small way through Spring Fed Records try and share uh, a little bit of it with, uh, with the rest of the world. Well, I think the proof is, is that they continue to welcome you and that they've added you to their family. Um, that, that's how you know that you're doing this with the right intention and 
not in an exploitative way. And it's really, it, it's producing remarkable music for, for those of us who haven't been down there yet um, to enjoy. And it makes me want to go. I want to wrap up this episode by talking about two more spring fed related topics. Um, the first is a, a record that's not even out yet, but that through our friendship I've known about for quite a while. And then we'll get to one that that is to conclude. You have this gargantuan release that that's that's soon going to be available to the public. And it features one of my favorite old time musicians whose work hasn't really been properly heard and enjoyed. Tell folks who who was Ed Haley. Ed Haley was a fiddle player. He also played banjo and guitar, although we don't have recordings of him, sadly, playing those instruments. But he's certainly known as a fiddle player and a singer as well. Uh, he was from Logan County, West Virginia. That's where he was born and raised, but spent most of his adult life in Ashland, Kentucky, which is right across the river from West Virginia. Uh, so both of those states uh, lay claim to Ed Haley as uh, as their own. Uh, he lived in the early 20th century, passed away in 1951. He was a professional musician for most of his life and supported his family, uh, raised a bunch of kids and had a stable household. Uh, as a blind man, this was one of the best um, avenues available to him, uh, you know, to... to support his family and, and to live a, a comfortable life uh, in that time and place. Uh, so he didn't ever make commercial recordings, at least not that we're aware of. Uh, there's a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence from people that remembered him um, to suggest that uh, he was uh, not trusting of the record men who came to town and uh, reportedly did make some offers to him uh, to make uh, commercial recordings. Uh, same sort of thing happened with John Salyer, uh, as I'm sure you know. In Ed's case, uh, it might have been because of his disability that he was particularly leery of working with these guys who'd come from New York or New Jersey or Chicago or wherever, because he was really afraid of, of being taken advantage of. Uh, as a blind man. Uh, so he preferred to make money uh, in a much more direct way, which was to play music for people, live people right in front of him, uh, who would then give him money. Um, he did play on the radio a little bit. There's some evidence for that, which is also a way of playing for people live, but not people right there with you. Um, but mostly what he did was he played on the streets, he played in in the square, he played on the courthouse steps, he played on trains, he played on ships on the river, he's right there in that, that area on the Ohio River, um, so a lot of uh, traffic coming through, uh, and you know he traveled to Cincinnati, he traveled around quite a bit, uh, he played at uh, boxing matches and all sorts of other games. Uh, gatherings, Fourth uh, of July picnics, I mean, you name it. He also played contests a lot, uh, and he earned a reputation for being essentially unbeatable uh, in contests, so there was prize money there as well. Uh, we wouldn't know Ed Haley's music except, you know, in stories, were it not for the fact that he made home recordings late in life. 1946 and 47, it looks like most or all of them were made in those two years. His stepson, Ralph, uh, had been in the Signal Corps uh, in the Army during the war. And uh, when he came home uh, at the end of World War II, he apparently had purchased a surplus um, home recording machine. These were, uh, this is just before magnetic tape uh, hit the consumer market. Uh, in the 1930s and 40s, there were these uh, home disc cutting recorders that were available. The The company that, that uh, had uh, probably the biggest share of the market was one called Wilcox Gay. And these were flat discs that, you know, they, they turn at 78 RPM generally, but 
usually when you say 78s, you're talking about commercial uh, 78s that were mass produced and, and made out of, sh of a shellac mixture and, and sold. These are a little bit different. They are, um, they come in different sizes and sometimes even different colors because you'd buy blanks from different companies. Uh, you know, maybe seven inch, 10 inch are pretty common. And they are lacquer discs. So they have a thin coating of lacquer over a base of either cardboard or aluminum. And um, the disc cutting machine looks like kind of a turntable contraption, but it's got a heavier tone arm uh, and it actually uh, cuts into the discs. Uh, you can use it for playback too, but it's it probably better just for, for the recording process. And there are little shavings that peel off and, and so on. Um, so Ed made uh, a very large number of recordings uh, with his son, Ralph, and also with uh, Ed's wife, Ella. Uh, and I definitely want to talk about Ella a little bit. She was also a musician and also blind, but had a different kind of background. Um, she went to the uh, Kentucky School for the Blind and learned how to read Braille and uh, was a piano teacher, uh, was at least qualified to be a piano teacher. And so she played um, accordion, uh, a piano accordion, and uh, Ed also taught her how to play mandolin to accompany uh, his uh, fiddling. Um, and she's got a very famous uh, kind of relentlessly aggressive kind of mandolin style that uh, Mike Compton and others have have uh, have studied and, and mastered. Ella was very much uh, a, a part of the music making of the family. She sometimes went out and played with Ed uh, for money for people in different settings, uh, accompanying him at square dances and things like that. And sometimes the two of them just playing together and singing old time songs on the street corner uh, in Ashland and other places. And Ella is on quite a lot of these recordings, not just accompanying Ed, but also there are a lot of recordings that feature Ella playing the accordion. There's a recording of her playing the, the beer barrel polka, for instance, on the accordion, a solo a solo recording. Um, there's a lot of them singing together where she's playing accordion, he's playing some fiddle kind of counter melodies and backup stuff. And the two of them are singing duets. Uh, a lot of old parlor and Tin Pan Alley repertory, come take a trip in my airship and songs like that. So um, Ed Haley's uh, recordings stayed within the family. Uh, he made a lot, uh, reportedly, uh, you know, two or three hundred uh, records uh, at the time, and they were divided up among the kids. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, several of the kids didn't really see much value in these recordings. They thought, well, you know, after the parents had passed on, this was just kind of, you know, dad's old stuff. It was kind of sweet, but there wasn't any real value in it. So they weren't well cared for. These lacquer discs are kind of uh, fragile to begin with because the lacquer can start to peel off, flake off. Um, some of them were actually just abused, like there are stories of kids in the family using them for Frisbees and stuff like that, which is just kind of heartbreaking to think about now. Um, but the one um, of their kids, of Ed and Ella's kids, who did uh, treasure and, and, and keep his allotment was Lawrence Haley. And Lawrence kept uh, 75 or 80 discs that he had. He, you know, he may have uh, been able to scrounge up a couple more from other family members and, and so on. Um, and he played them a lot, which wore them down, but, but he, he valued them both as documents of his parents' music making. Uh, and also I think he had a sense of their larger cultural value. Now the first, um, kind of awakening of, uh, of interest in Ed Haley's music took place in the 70s. There were um, researchers, fiddle and folk music researchers, several of them associated with the Library of Congress, uh, people like Mark Wilson and Alan Jabor and Gus Mead, who were doing a lot of research on the fiddle traditions uh, in the Middle Appalachian region and were interviewing a lot of people. And when they were in Eastern Kentucky and into you know Southwestern West Virginia, they would hear this name Ed Haley quite a lot. 
uh, J.P. Fraley talked about him, and Clark Kessinger talked about him, and all these different people talked about Ed Haley. And so they started to get a sense of this. I mean, at first, Alan Jabor thought he might have been a, kind of a, a purely mythic figure, uh, you know, almost like a, a Bigfoot, uh, a fiddling Bigfoot kind of figure. Uh, but he but he soon realized that there was, you know, some some real evidence for um, for Ed Haley's uh, music making, his influence on other fiddlers. Uh, he, as I mentioned earlier, he traveled around a lot and played in different communities with different musicians. So people knew him here and there and everywhere, it seems. But they didn't think they would ever be able to hear his music. When they finally got in touch with Lawrence and realized, well, here's a, a you know, a, a living child and we can interview him, which they did in the 70s. And, and Jabor or Mark Wilson, one of them said something like, well, it's too, you know, it's wonderful to hear all these stories about your father and his music, but it's too bad, you know, we'll never get to hear him. And, and Lawrence said, what do you mean? I've got a whole stack of records right over here. And they, these guys just you know, basically fell out of their chairs when they when they heard that. So uh, Mark Wilson and, and Gus Mead produced uh, the first commercial issue of some of these home recordings that had been made in the 40s. And that came out uh, in the 1970s, I forget the exact year, um, uh, as an LP um, released by Rounder Records and that called Parkersburg Landing. And it didn't get much attention. It's a, it's a really great record, but it didn't get much attention at all until a guy named John Hartford, who was browsing LPs in a store in Colorado, found this record. And there's a picture, an old picture of a fiddle player on the front and a picture of a steamboat on the back to allude to Ed's involvement with, with the river boats and so on. Um, two of John Hartford's favorite topics. So he bought this record and he took it home, but he didn't listen to it right away. He tells this story later that when he kind of rediscovered it among his things and put it on finally, he said, oh, let's see what this is all about, that he listened to it and by the time he reached to flip the LP over to side two, his hands were trembling from what he was hearing. This was, you know, in Hartford's mind, he had found the source. He had found the fiddler, you know, um, you know to, to outdo any other fiddler, the fiddler who kind of perfectly embodied everything he loved, everything Hartford loved about traditional fiddling, but also pointing the way towards bluegrass and, and contest and other kinds of modern fiddling. Uh, Hartford even developed a... a a bit of a far-fetched theory that that Ed Haley was somehow the 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 godfather of Texas style contest fiddling, even though there's no evidence that Ed Haley ever set foot in Texas. Um, by way of of Georgia Slim, Rutland, and and other fiddlers, um, Hartford developed this this theory, uh, which I don't think is there's much to it. But but Hartford had latched on to him in a way that he. I think, uh, thought would, would legitimize himself in the old time music world. So some of the other towering figures and authoritative figures in the old time fiddle revival, like Alan Jabor, for instance, Jabor had Henry Reed, the Virginia fiddler, who was the guy that Jabor spent a lot of time with, and he learned his about his life, and he transcribed his tunes, and all that stuff is still up on the Library of Congress website, by the way, if anybody's interested. Uh, and Henry Reed was the source fiddler who helped to establish Jabor as the authority that he became. And there are other examples of, of uh, revivalists and scholars who had similar experiences kind of latching on um, to certain people. Uh, I mentioned John Salyer earlier. So Bruce Green with John Salyer. It's, a, it's another a kind of similar tale in a way. Well, Hartford had found his guy, and that was Ed Haley. And for good reason, because Haley is a, an extraordinary fiddler. So Hartford started to research uh, Haley's life and Haley's music, went down every possible rabbit hole uh, he could find related to um, to Haley and and even some things that ended up not being so related to Haley, but he just wanted 
he, he, and he wanted to get inside of Ed Haley's skin. He wanted to be Ed Haley. I mean, he really wanted, it was an obsession. Uh, there's really, you know, no more fitting word for it. Um, he undertook uh, research and interviews and, and uh, you know, very, very extensive uh, working with um, a, a West Virginian um, a researcher, a young historian named Brandon Kirk. And together they produced a sprawling manuscript uh, about Ed Haley and his family and the whole environment in which he lived in, and worked, uh, which has still never been published. I'm not sure that it ever will be published, but that's a whole other story to itself. But, but I've read it uh, because we have a copy of it here at the Center for Popular Music uh, in the archive. And it's just incredible the amount of work that Hartford poured into uh, his Ed Haley research. And Hartford, of course, started to play Haley's tunes, uh, which you know ultimately came out as one of one of Hartford's last uh, records, not the last record, but one of the later ones um, that came out in the late '90s, uh, called "Speed of the Old Longbow," which is a tribute to Ed Haley, um, and. Um, at least as important, maybe more importantly, um, Hartford uh, oversaw the um, the release of two double CDs, so four CDs in total, of Haley's fiddle music, uh, also put out by Rounder, that came out in, I think it was 1997. Bob Carlin was a producer on that and various other people uh, involved. The trouble with the or two problems with with those releases, in in my opinion, number one is that the transfers and the mastering uh, were pretty rough. So the discs are were by that time uh, thirty year old home recordings on these unique one of a kind lacquer discs that had been played a lot and not necessarily treated that well. So they're pretty rough condition. And the transfers were done pretty quickly, um, without perhaps without taking as much care as as uh, should have been taken. But they wanted to get it done, and the Library of Congress was involved here at the uh, Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, we were involved uh, as well, long before my time. Um, so they were transferred to digital, but not done in an optimal way, which makes them very hard to listen to. They are really, really noisy. Some tracks are worse than others, uh, but a, a, as a whole, if anybody's familiar with the uh, those Haley recordings that came out on Rounder in the 90s, you know, you gotta be pretty committed <laughs> to, uh, to sit and listen to those. And of course, a lot of people have, and a lot of Haley's tunes started to circulate as a result of that. But they're a hard thing to just kind of sit and enjoy because of the, the really, really rough um, audio fidelity. The other problem with those recordings, in my opinion, is, is that they focused entirely on Ed Haley's fiddling. And not without good reason, because Ed Haley's fiddling is extraordinary, but this was uh, quite conspicuously to the exclusion of Ella, except as a mandolin accompanist, and also excluding all of the parlor repertory, nearly all of the singing that Ed Haley did, uh, certainly all the singing that Ella did. If you take this body of Haley home recordings as a whole, and again, we don't have all of them, but the ones that survived through, um, through Lawrence, um, there's a lot of music that John Hartford just decided didn't serve his purposes. He wanted to put Ed Haley out there as this kind of font, this patriarchal figure, a source fiddler in the you know most dramatic sense. And while Haley deserves all of that, it's also significant that uh, Hartford um, uh, and and Carlin and others uh, kind of deliberately excluded a big chunk of what the Haley family and Ed and Ella together had done uh, musically. So then we come along, Spring Fed Records. Um, about five years ago, we got in touch with Lawrence's son, who lives here in Nashville, Steve Haley, and who has all the discs that his father kept. And uh, getting to know Steve, we proposed that 
we could do uh, fresh transfers and do them very, very carefully. And then we have a record label and we could put this stuff out as a box set, including everything, not just Ed's fiddling, which is honestly the thing that draws people to the Haley legacy first and foremost, but we wanted people to hear this, this other part of it, uh, the part that features Ella, the part where Ed and Ella are singing together and doing, doing repertory that um, kind of goes against the image of Ed as the, uh, you know, the, the master fiddler. Um, it, it doesn't undermine that. I, in my mind, it broadens it. And I think that's, that's really important. So Steve uh, brought the discs in. You've had the the uh, f uh, the uh, good fortune to be able to to see and hold those discs. And and just as a reminder to people listening, these are unique. I mean, when you pick up one of those Ed Haley discs and it says Cherry River Rag, like that's it. That's the disc, the one that was actually cut in the dining room of the Haley home uh, in 1946 or 47. Um, and that has already been through a couple of, uh, of, you know, transfers and releases and so on. So the, um, transfer and restoration work was undertaken by Martin Fisher, who is on the staff here at, uh, the Center for Popular Music. He's the, um, manager of the sound recording collection, which numbers close to 300,000 in total, by the way. So that's a big job. But, uh, Martin is a whiz with, um, sound preservation and earlier recording technology. Uh, and he has creative, low budget ways of, uh, of solving problems and getting good results. I mean, he, man can do, he can work miracles with uh, a rubber band and a popsicle stick um, and, and a, a bottle of ivory soap. Um, but he's, he's just an extraordinary guy and, and he devoted, um, I, I can't even begin to calculate how many hours he spent just cleaning the records properly, uh, even down to the point of, you know, wearing, uh, you know, magnifying glass uh, and, and, and picking individual grains of dirt and grime out of the grooves. Um, and then the transfers, which he did using six or seven or eight different size and shape of stylus, just to see which ones work best. Like not all these records are the same. You know, they came, they were different blanks, they're different sizes. Some are aluminum base, some are cardboard base. And most importantly, they've all been treated or mistreated differently over the years. So some of them, uh, they each one presents a unique set of problems. Uh, each individual disc, each side of e each disc presents a unique set of problems. And Martin experimented with different styli, he did wet plays and dry plays. A wet play means he's actually squirting distilled water onto the disc as it's playing and as it's transferring and wiping that up, um, which is not something you should try at home, kids. It's, uh, it's a good way to ruin a record or ruin a, a turntable uh, if you really don't know what you're doing. But Martin played around with all this stuff in order to get the best possible results. And then once into the digital realm, he... Um, set about to um, you know, reduce the noise and balance the EQ and take out clicks and pops and things like that. Generally speaking, um, Martin and John and, and Steve Haley and I as producers, uh, we all agreed that we didn't want to use a real heavy hand on the processing uh, for fear. I mean, if you take out too many of those clicks and pops, you can take out some musical information with that. Uh, and we thought, well, let's clean them up and make them listenable, uh, which they certainly are now, much more than, than the previous commercial releases. But we don't want to overdo it. And we're certainly not going to pretend that we can get these, you know, anywhere near 21st century studio quality. We're going to make the best out of what what we're working with here sonically and try not to overdo it. Um, so the result, which I hope will be out very soon, uh, sometime this year, uh, and we are really getting close at this point. It's been a long, long labor of love. Um, but the result is going to be a box set of 
looks like now seven CDs. We're up to seven CDs. Um, and it's going to have everything that people have already heard from Ed Haley from the previous releases, but now in these fresh transfers and remasters are sounding a whole lot better, along with all the stuff that people haven't heard before. Um, most of which features Ed or the two of them together, as I mentioned, but there are even some, some other takes of fiddle tunes that never got released before. There are a handful of, um, of fiddle recordings um, that didn't get released before, like, uh, well, I'll, I'll let out a little, a little secret here. There's a recording of Ed Haley playing Bill Monroe's Kentucky Waltz, which is pretty incredible. Considering it was recorded in 1946 or 47, which is right around the time that tune, I mean, when Monroe released his own recording. Uh, but Monroe was playing it on the radio, playing it on the Opry, and which might suggest that Ed Haley was listening to the radio uh, and probably picked it up on one pass. And when you hear his version of Kentucky Waltz, you can believe that he picked it up on one pass because it's it's a unique version. It's uh, The phrasing is, is uh, a little uh, odd, but I mean that in a good way. Um, but it's just a remarkable document that, that Ed Haley was actually – playing a Bill Monroe composition around the time Bill Monroe was playing it for the, you know, the, in his, in his, you know, the earliest performances. So there's all kinds of neat stuff that's going to come out in this. It's going to be a nice booklet, uh, with the box set, uh, with, um, a lot of pictures of Ed and Ella and other members of the family that, that have been circulated before, but some that have not. Um, that come out of Steve's family collection and maybe some other family members that uh, contributed a few pictures here and there. And then um, a series of original essays to um, contextualize Ed and Ella in various ways. I've written one. Steve Haley wrote a, the longest of all the essays in the booklet, which is really about the family legacy. Um, and uh, Dan Margulies wrote one. Brittany Haas wrote an essay for us. Uh, who am I leaving out? Oh, Mark Wilson, who, of course, was involved in the very first Ed Haley revival back in the 1970s. And so he uh, recounts a little bit of what that was like. Uh, it was nice to have Mark involved in the project. Uh, we've got original artwork by Megan Lytell. We've got um, uh, layout is being done by Heather Mulder. Uh, who uh, a lot of people in Nashville will know as a musician and as a, a very fine uh, graphic artist uh, who works, uh, you know, do, does uh, letter, block, letter block printing and so on. Um, John Fabke himself, of course, is involved also in some of the design and layout. It's going to be a really, really nice package. And um, I hope that it's, uh, it's going to uh, reignite uh, interest in Haley's music, not that it's ever really waned since the 90s, but I think we're on the verge of a of another uh, and even bigger uh, surge, if I can borrow a little uh, pandemic language here. <laughs> and, um, and I also um, really look forward to uh, how uh, our approach, our comprehensive approach, and in including basically everything that we have our hands on, not just the stuff that features Ed as, you know, a master fiddler, but everything else will really broaden everybody's sense of what the Haley musical family legacy really is and what it really means. Well, it is a massive undertaking, and I, I'm trying not to overstate this, but I think it is maybe the most important upcoming record release um, for the old-time music community and the broader just vernacular music, you know, that includes old time music, but trickles out into the bluegrass and, and folks who are interested in in parlor music. And I just the work that you and John and Martin with Steve's help from the family are doing and then all the essays, this is going to be huge. And folks who are listening should make a point of following Spring Fed Records on social media. They have a great Facebook presence and they're on Instagram. And then just you can check in on their website and. Um, to learn more and make sure you get a copy of this box set. Now, before we go, I want to wrap up with one more spring fed artist. And there's a connection to the Ed Haley project because the last time I saw you and Dan 
and John and the aforementioned Mike Compton was when all of us with many fiddlers uh, added to the mix played a sold out show at the Station Inn in Nashville that you organized. And it was an Ed Haley tribute night. And Haley's fiddle was there, thanks to the Haley family, Steve in particular. Um, you were very generous in bringing me down to be one of the fiddlers, but we also had Tim O'Brien, Raina Gellert, Clelia Stefanini, Tyler Andall. Yeah, we, we couldn't get anybody good, unfortunately. We had to settle for all those, you know, second rate uh, fiddle players, but it came out okay anyway. <laughs> we also had Brittany Haas, who you mentioned. And all of this is actually, there's a YouTube video from the Station Inn that I'll include in the show notes. So, um, Y'all should watch this video of the entire show uh, broadcast live from the station in. But one of the one of the young fiddlers who was on that night was someone whom you've gotten to know. And we're going to end the episode by playing an entire track of his, the Yum Yum Blues. Um, but that was an amazing night where we celebrated Ed Haley's fiddle music in particular and previewed the, the forthcoming release of this album. But it also was a in some ways a coming out party for this great Middle Tennessee musician named Austin Derryberry. Could you give us just a little bit of background about Austin, the album he made with Tater, and then and then set up the Yum Yum Blues, which will uh, end the episode? Absolutely. Uh, so Austin Derryberry is a young fiddle player, um, actually a multi-instrumentalist and a singer. Uh, he is from Bedford County, which is a little bit farther south from where we are. That would put it about an hour and a half uh, south, southeast of Nashville. And um, Austin, I met when I first moved to Tennessee in 2014, and I got in touch with Buddy Ingram, who is a local folklorist, recently retired from the Tennessee State Park system. Uh, Buddy is quite a character. He's a musician. He's done a lot of uh, collecting and documentary work uh, over his uh, life. And every year, Buddy... Um, he has a, a an old 1930s flatbed truck that he has outfitted as a kind of medicine show stage, very old timey with velvet curtains and all sorts of uh, uh, contraptions, and it's a lot of fun. And and every year he um, he hauls that thing up to uh, Wilson County, which is uh, the first county uh, just north of where I am, for the Wilson County Fair which is the largest fair in the state of Tennessee. It's actually bigger than the state fair. Uh, the Wilson County Fair is quite an experience, and there's kind of an old-timey pioneer village that's that's part of the fairgrounds there, and, and, and uh, he sets up his medicine show stage, and he invites other musicians to come by and play as much as they want, and he plays with them. He's got his own group that's always uh, kind of a changing personnel, rotating personnel called the Galley Nippers. And uh, so that year, is my very first year in, in Tennessee uh, in 2014, and he invited me to come play guitar with him um, as a, a new member of the Galley Nippers. Buddy's a banjo player, and to uh, anchor the band as fiddler, he invited Austin Derryberry and also Austin's father, Brian, who's a bass player. So that's how I first got introduced to Austin. He was, he must have been 16 at the time, something like that. Uh, and he was already a kind of jaw dropping old time fiddler and not the kind who approaches tunes in a dainty kind of way um to be handled you know with kit gloves and so on no austin he's he's like you know all in pedal to the floor all the time uh that is his approach to old time fiddling this young man lives and breathes old time music uh and he is particularly interested in or devoted to the music of this general area so Middle Tennessee, the Nashville area, stretching down through Chattanooga, where there have been a number of great old-time fiddlers over the years. Northern Alabama, so like the Stripling Brothers stuff is a big part of his repertory. And then down into North Georgia and Atlanta. So uh, a lot of the stuff from the Skillet Liquors and, and folks like that um, are kind of the, the essence of his his repertory and also his stylistic approach. 
Uh, he is kind of, um, I, I've, I've even heard him described as kind of a vaudeville fiddler in that, you know, he, he plays, he'll play pop tunes alongside, you know, square dance numbers. Um, he likes raggy kind of stuff and, uh, you know, things that uh, he likes to play in F and C and work B flat, work through uh, tunes that that wind their way through uh, circle of fifths kind of progressions. I mean, he loves that kind of material uh, in particular. And uh, I've had the chance uh, to play with Austin in a number of of different settings um, over the years. Watched him uh, grow into uh, a really really fine uh, young musician. Um, as he matured, he went to school here at MTSU. He's now graduated. I actually had him in a class of mine on um, uh, music of the South, and that was a lot of fun to have him uh, g give his perspective in that class. And uh, as you mentioned, he, you know, he was in on the the Ed Haley uh, uh, event. Even though Ed Haley is a little bit outside of, you know, especially in terms of regional styles, it's a little bit outside of of where Austin is usually focused. He doesn't play a lot of stuff from Kentucky and um, and uh, West Virginia. Uh, but Ed Haley, as a, an aggressive fiddler who um, played a lot of variations, never played a tune the same way twice. Um, that kind of speaks, I think, to, to Austin's, uh, approach as well. So he does have some Ed Haley stuff in his repertory. And, uh, a couple of years ago, I really thought that we needed to do a record with Austin, uh, for spring fed. There's another young fiddle player who I've also had the pleasure to, uh, to get to know and to play with and to, to watch him mature. And, and uh, his name is, uh, Trenton Tater Carruthers. And Tater is from uh, Cookville, Tennessee, which is up on the Cumberland Plateau. He's a little bit younger than uh, Austin and uh, has devoted himself to that uh, very distinctive repertory of the Upper Cumberland's region. So it's kind of this area between Nashville and Knoxville. You have the Cumberland Plateau or the Cumberland Mountains, and it stretches up into southern Kentucky a little bit. Uh, some of the the great musicians that have come out of that area that have inspired Tater in particular are like Burnett and Rutherford, Clyde Davenport in particular, who uh, Tater actually got to play with and, and learn from a little bit. John Sharp, um, who like Haley only made home recordings. Um, and uh, the one person who really mentored Tater was uh, directly was Michael DeFoche. Uh, who is pretty well known in this immediate area, but not to the larger old time community because he kept a very, very low profile. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, but Defoche was somebody who was extremely dedicated to the specific repertory and style of the Upper Cumberlands. And he took Tater under his wing. They did an apprenticeship program through the uh, Tennessee Arts Commission. And I decided that um, I wanted to do a double album, like fill up a whole CD really to the brim with music by Austin and Tater. And they know each other and they played a lot together uh, over the years, but they are very different stylistically. They have very different repertories. So I didn't want to make this like a real duo record. I thought, well, let's do half of it as an Austin Derryberry album and the other half as a Tater Carruthers album. When you listen to it all the way through, you can really hear that 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 shift. There are two tracks, one at the beginning and one at the end, where they do play together. So I let them uh, really cut loose. We brought in uh, a, a number of other, a small number of other um, string band uh, accompanists of the highest order. Uh, Connor Vliestra playing uh, banjo and not a single bar of claw hammer in the whole thing. He's playing old time two and three finger styles on uh, on a on a, a Gibson uh, resonator banjo, but it ain't bluegrass. It's an, this is another facet of old time banjo playing that uh, of course, Matt, I know you have delved into and you teach uh, pretty extensively, but a lot of folks in the old time community think of old time banjo as claw hammer and not necessarily uh, anything more. Well, well Connor really, really um, uh, does a beautiful job. He uh, plays on practically every track. Uh, Corbin Hazlett plays guitar 
on a bunch of it, and he's just a killer, um, uh, you know, backup guitar player. Really understands how to use runs and how to apply that. Courtney Derryberry, who is Austin's wife, also plays guitar in a few tracks, and uh, and I got to play guitar in a few tracks as well. That's it. There's no bass. There's no mandolin. It's really kind of stripped down to the essence of fiddle, banjo, and guitar. Kind of the the trio core of the old time string band. And then there are a few tracks that are solo fiddle or just fiddle banjo duets, something like that. Um, we recorded here in the MTSU recording studios. We have a big recording industry department here. It's in the same building where my office is, where the Center for Popular Music is. And we had never collaborated directly with them in this capacity before. I wrote a grant proposal for the Tennessee Arts Commission. I want to give them a shout out for the funding support that the uh, Tennessee Arts Commission provided us for this project. And we went into the studio here uh, with a master's student in audio engineering um, named Gleb Yaravoy, and he did a superb job with the audio. He did all the engineering and the mixing and mastering as well. I mean, just really a pleasure to work with him. And we recorded this whole album in two days and then spent another two days mixing it. And like, and that was it. And then Gleb mastered it and we were done. And I had high hopes for this project and the final result exceeded my high hopes for this project. It is really just, I mean, I know I'm biased here since I produced it and played on it and it's on our label here, but, but uh, if you'll permit me a, a little bit of boastfulness, I, I would say it's one of the best new, newly recorded old time records to come out in a long time. Uh, and I hope it's going to get um, Austin and Tater more of the, the credit that, uh, and attention that they, uh, that they deserve. They're both pretty soft-spoken guys. They're not, you know, ones who are going to uh, really, uh, you know, take over a crowd uh, until they start playing their fiddles. And then you're like, oh man, like this is, this is, there's something going on here, something really special. So the album is called Tennessee Breakdown. It came out just over a year ago. It came out, uh, I think the official release was in January, 2020. We played uh, just a couple of release shows before the pandemic shut everything down. Unfortunately, we were scheduled to do some more, including even uh, a station in gig was supposed to happen last April and uh, obviously got canceled. So that's too bad. But but the album is out there. I mean, Springfed stuff is on every kind of streaming and download site. Uh, and of course, to, to purchase these records, uh, most of them, I think all of them now are up on, on Amazon. If you want to buy the CD, you can order them directly from us. Uh, if you go to the Center for Popular Music website on the right-hand side, there's a link to Springfed Records or just go to springfedrecords.com. You can find it or send me an email or whatever you want. All sorts of ways. We're, we're happy to, uh, to sell you these CDs. Um, but it's, uh, it's a beautiful package too. I was really happy with how the package came out for Tennessee Breakdown. Uh, John Fabke did the, um, did the layout of the whole thing, but the photography, most of it, like the cover, uh, front and back cover photography was done by a guy named Alan Messer. Alan is a professional photographer in Nashville, uh, originally from Britain and uh, actually started his career uh, as an apprentice on shoots for Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles. So that kind of tells you a little something about the trajectory of Alan Messer's career. He has photographed seemingly everybody in the country and rock and Americana worlds. I mean, sadly, every time somebody passes away, one of these icons passes away, you can be sure that Alan's got pictures to go up on, on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so Alan came out, um, we um, did the photography during the first and still now only Thomas Maupin uh, Fiddle Festival uh, down in Bedford County uh, that Austin and his family helped uh, to organize a beautiful, beautiful setting, uh, Maupin Fest. We had to cancel it last year, but hopefully we're gonna be back this August. And uh, Alan Messer came out and uh, we did the photography right there uh, during the festival, this beautiful site, a beautiful day, and uh, uh, just another uh, added kind of cherry on top for, uh, for this great uh, project. And 
we are just so proud of of Tennessee Breakdown and and hope that that Austin and Tater both uh, you know go on to to great things. I should mention they they're both uh, aspiring luthiers. Um, Austin is building fiddles, and for his day job, he builds guitars at Gallagher Guitars. And Gallagher, for those who don't know the brand, is probably best known through Doc Watson. It was a guitar that Doc played for many, many years. Uh, they used to be built in Wartrace, Tennessee, which is south of here, actually real close to where Austin lives. Um, but just uh, about two years ago, the business was sold bought by a businessman here in Murfreesboro and they relocated to the square. So now the the factory, which is also workshop, which is also uh, a little performance venue, is right here on the square in Murfreesboro, just a couple miles away from where I sit now. And, and Austin works there. Uh, Tater is doing uh, more and more repair work. Uh, Tater is still, well, he's still high school age, I think, uh, or he's just just about 18 at this point. Uh, so he's just starting out on his, uh, his journey and his career. Um, but both of these guys are, are super talented and, uh, man, if, if you haven't heard them, you need to hear them. Well, folks, you're going to hear Austin right now. Greg, thank you so much for being here, for sharing so much of your time and knowledge. As we go, can you set up the Yum Yum Blues? Yeah, the Yum Yum Blues comes from one of Austin's favorite fiddle players, Clayton McMitchin. Uh, a lot of people know him as uh, a one-time member of the Skillet Liquors. Uh, he also had the Georgia Wildcats and, um, you know, did a bunch of recordings uh, in the 20s and 30s under his own name. Uh, he was a real virtuoso of the time uh, who was an old-time fiddler, but also embraced a lot of the jazz and ragtime influences, Tin Pan Alley influences of the time. So kind of right in the wheelhouse of what Austin loves. And this is a song that Clayton McMitchin recorded and sang. And uh, it's really the only vocal track on Tennessee Breakdown uh, with Austin singing the Yum Yum Blues. She loves me and I don't mean maybe She tells me this post every night and day And when I'm gone she'll miss me Oh, she says, honey, kiss me Kiss me in that good old-fashioned way And I say, baby, don't be bashful Till your daddy come Well, lip to lip, gum to gum Close them smackers, yum, yum, yum Oh, baby, I won't leave you Cause I don't want to grieve you Leave you with those yum yum blues. to the show Mama stays out dancing but Papa never knows Most folks have their hobbies They can have just what they may I'll go back on the town just to drive my blues away And I've been to see my baby She loves me and I don't mean maybe She tells me this post every night and day And when I'm gone she'll miss me Oh she says honey kiss me Kiss me in that good old fashioned way And I said, baby, don't be bashful Till your daddy come Well, lip to lip, drum to drum Pulls them smackers, yum, yum, yum Well, baby, I won't leave you Cause I don't want to grieve you Leave you with those yum, yum blues Be 
eyes close. Tell your daddy come. Well, lip to lip, rum to gum, put some smackers, yum, yum, yum. Well, baby, I won't leave you, cause I don't want to grieve you. Leave you with those yum, yum blues. Relax Your Grid is produced, edited, and mixed by me, Matt Brown. My father, Tim Brown, provides some crucial post-production assistance, and all the design work is performed by Otto Allard. In the interview, Greg mentioned different banjo styles for old-time music beyond clawhammer banjo. If you'd like to learn more about that, check out my free instructional website, twofingerbanjo.com. Tune in next time for my interview with pioneering old-time guitarist Mark Harris. And until then, relax your grid. <laughs>